Uh, hello, everybody. I have been asked by Ted to introduce myself, so I will. <laughs> uh, my name is James Owens, for those who do not know me, and Ellen is this, Ellen is this, so that. Se on nelikymmentä asti, että se oli näin aikaisesti saattanut Suomessa. So I guess you can call me uh, an Esther file after 42 years of madness, mostly. Um, I uh, began my academic career looking at Central and Eastern Europe, and I ended up, of course, becoming a banker because I can't count, which explains the financial crises of many years. Um, today we have, I think, a remarkable event, and we have been extremely lucky to bring together a group of very interesting, brilliant minds in Cambridge, backed by uh, real political heft, um, practitioners of politics, practitioners of history, into uh, the Cambridge Geopolitics Centre. And one of the major features of that centre is Baltic Studies. This is a new project, something that has begun only relatively recently. We are networking across the whole of Central and Eastern Europe um, for the North, so that means Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Poland, Germany, and Iceland. So the Nordic Baltic. And this is suddenly very important. And it is topical and it is, I think, essential for us in our region together, which I think includes Britain and Ireland, to work and to understand more and to build together um, a common understanding of the challenges that we face using the uh, academic tools of history, of politics, and specifically in this instance of geopolitics. We have uh, a network of universities, including here at Tartu and the Baltic Defence College and beyond in Helsinki, and indeed the team have just come from Helsinki. And that network is crucial to the way that the University of Cambridge is thinking about how we're going to build um, uh, an academic program which is internationally significant. Now, I have been honoured uh, to be part of the advisory team to what I think is one of the most important projects um, in the field. And it has been exciting and interesting to see the interest and commitment that is coming out from all parts of the region, but specifically from where I live, namely here. I have to say that we have been so lucky um, because uh, Thea Danilov and the Foresight Centre have been incredibly generous with their time and with their resources to promote what we hope will be a really significant um, uh, event today. It is to explore how we can build this, to work together, to have ideas to establish a dialogue. Now, Thea is our host, and we are incredibly grateful for all the work that she, her team, and the Riga Kogu have put together. And so I'd like to say thank you so much, and to invite you to begin the uh, event today, and uh, to, to, to kick us off and keep us straight and narrow. Thanks, Thea. Thank you so much, James, and uh, the pleasure is all mine. And I can assure you that this event is mutually beneficial uh, also to, to the Foresight Centre. We, we are very highly appreciate the chance to host uh, today's seminar. Um, Honourable guests uh, from Britain, from the Cambridge University, um, Ambassador, Estonian guests, I'm very Glad to, to welcome you here in the Foresight Centre. And uh, in fact, the Foresight Centre is a very small unit of uh, only six people, but with a very big mandate. We are to implement the Estonian Foresight Act that the Estonian Parliament approved back in uh, 2016. And it says that um, we have to. Uh, build future scenarios in different fields, in different domains, and mo most importantly to highlight, uh, or I would even say underline, risks and opportunities that these different alternative scenarios might entail uh, for Estonia. And um, should you like to mo know more about our doings, so you can check it out uh, from our website, and 
you cannot study uh, future without having a deep understanding uh, of the past. Uh, future is uh, rooted in today and yesterday, um, and uh, the world is much more path dependent than we normally would like to admit. And uh, one of the sad illustrations, of course, is the, is the uh, horrible war in Ukraine and uh, all the many people in the Western world, also in Estonia, who, who are right now saying that um, we didn't get Russia right. It is said that history is a good teacher, but we occasionally are uh, not so good pupils. So uh, I'm, I'm glad, I'm very glad that today's event gave us uh, two attention to the past, present and the future of the British political relationships with the potential opportunities for, for both, both parties. And uh, I'm especially honoured and, and, um, and delighted to introduce our today's uh, speakers. Uh, to start on the left, uh, Professor Brendan Sims and his uh, professor uh, on uh, history of international relations in Cambridge. Great to have you here. Um, ambassador to Estonia, uh, Mr. Ross Allen, great to see you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Charles Clark, a long term politician uh, and um, uh, served in, in various uh, British governments and also a leader of uh, Baltic Geopolitics program in Cambridge. And if this was an understatement, you can correct me uh, later on. <laughs> uh, great to have you here. And Professor uh, Kara Birima from Tartu University also with, with good connections to, uh, to the Cambridge University as far as I know. So as you see, a very distinguished panel. And uh, again, um, I'm honored to, to, uh, to host this event and hoping you a memorable and highly useful evening. Thank you so much. Enjoy. that one. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Theo, for that. Uh, tremendous introduction, really appreciate, and thank you, James, for introducing uh, the whole event. My role now, I'm going to moderate the panel, is to uh, introduce what the panel is going to say and do, and then, to, but to begin with a few words about the Baltic Geopolitical Program itself. Uh, what is going to happen is that Brendan is going to speak for 10 to 15 minutes about the history of the relationship between Britain and the Baltic. Ross is going to talk about the current relationship between Britain and the Baltic. And uh, Carol is going to talk about how we deal with the Russian situation at the moment from his angle. Then uh, we're going to have a discussion and then... I think I think so, but... That's a lot better, I think. Sorry about that. <laughs> then, and after that, Professor Christina Turnison, the Dean of the Johann Skype School at Tartu University, is going to comment on the discussion and give her reflections on where the discussion has gone today. And I'm delighted that we, all these people are speaking together in this uh, panel. I'm here today to really introduce the programme. The Baltic Geopolitics Programme in Cambridge is a very recent program. It's only been going for just longer than a year. And it was established by myself and Professor Brendan Sims because we believed it was critically important for us to get a stronger focus on UK's Baltic relationship and the challenges uh, of, that, we, that we have. Uh, the purpose of the centre is around five different things. One, events around the Baltic. Two, the UK relationship with the Baltic, which has got a very particular history, very particular circumstances. Three, the history of the relationship, because our belief is very strongly that the current geopolitical situation uh, learns a great deal from the history, though, as Teo said, whether the lessons are always learned is a question that is very appropriate to raise. Four, to try and bring together academics such as Brendan and practitioners such as myself in politics, diplomatic life, government, business, and so on. And fifthly, to take for every uh, dimension of everything that we're looking at, whether it's uh, climate change, energy, migration, what is the geopolitical implication of that process. We have a network of universities throughout the region. 
uh, in uh, the uh, founder university member in Estonia was Tartu University and we were delighted that Christina and her colleagues were ready to work with us from the outset in such a very positive way. Uh, we have an advisory body and in this room we have from our advisory committee apart from James Oates, David Liddington here who was a, a senior minister in the British government dealing with European and international affairs until recently and David Cairns who was a British ambassador uh, to Sweden uh, until what two three years ago David I think. So we're, we've got a wide range of expertise, a wide range of skills involved in our programme. We're hoping to develop our activities. We've already had over 20 different events, including a very successful in-person uh, event in Cambridge uh, about a month and a half ago. And we want to develop our activity. We welcome your interest. We welcome any support you're able to offer us during the course of developing our work. You'll find on the leaflets around, in the, uh, around the room details of what we are and what we're trying to achieve. And we very much hope that you'll contact us afterwards if there's any way in which you'd like to learn more about us or to see where we can go. So with that, I'm going to set off with the meat of the event. And our first speaker, as I said, is Professor Brendan Sims. Brendan. Thank you. Uh, could, could I speak from... Yes, yes you can. Yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you, can you hear me? Is this, this is working. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Charles, uh, for that uh, introduction, but also uh, thank you very much indeed to Tia Danilov uh, and James Oates for making this possible, and of course, uh, the Foresight uh, Center uh, in general uh, for hosting us. Uh, you just heard from Charles Clark uh, about the nature of our Baltic program, and as he said, one of the things he mentioned uh, was uh, our uh, central focus on the role of history. Uh, but what is that history? What is the history of uh, the UK's uh, engagement with the Baltic Sea region? Um, so I've been asked to speak for 10 to 15 minutes uh, about that, and it's going to be a sort of a gallop uh, through 600 years or, or so of history. And the central point uh, we want to get across is that the very intense connection we have actually at the moment, politically and militarily, uh, it's really a high point um, uh, of the connection, that that in fact is actually uh, not necessarily anomalous, it's actually embedded in this longer history. Now in substantive terms, you'll be glad to hear, I'm not going to go back to the Viking era, in substantive terms, uh, this uh, connection uh, really began during the early Middle Ages, uh, when much of northern and eastern England and Scotland um, did indeed uh, bear the brunt of Viking raids, uh, mostly mounted uh, from Denmark. And this was uh, the, uh, the, the moment uh, when the phrase Dengeld entered the English language, first as a tribute paid to buy off the attackers, and then as a tax levied to fund the defence of the realm against them. Um, so actually, as, as many people here will know, uh, half a century before the Battle of Hastings, England was actually conquered by the Danish king, Knut, briefly making the country part of a polity spanning the North Sea. So right at the very beginning, uh, we already have a connection with Denmark and the Baltic Sea region. But then that connection intensifies. In the later Middle Ages, it's principally a trading relationship. Many British East Coast towns, such as Boston, Kings Lynn, uh, and in fact Edinburgh, were staple towns of the Hanseatic League the dominant economic ordering system in the area. Uh, big trade in, in, in fish and grain. And the historian David Abulafia, in his magisterial study, The Boundless Sea, uh, refers to the Baltic as the Mediterranean of the North. And this was the area with which uh, England and Scotland had this very close connection. So over the next 100 years or so, relations between the British states, by which I mean England, Scotland, and later Great Britain, and the Baltic remained important but then became, and this is the critical point, more geopolitical. So it's not just an economic connection. During the Thirty Years' War in the first half of the 17th century, many looked in England and Scotland to the Swedish king Gustavus Adolphus to defend the Protestant cause in Germany. During the 18th century, the Baltic became the source of critical naval supplies, such as ships, masts, and hemp. So the Royal Navy could not really have operated without that Baltic connection. This trade produced its own tensions. Catherine the Great of Russia, for example, complained that the British, and I quote, 
were always exceedingly jealous of the trade carried on with her, and seldom binds herself by treaties with other states, and depends upon no other laws than her own. This may sound familiar <laughs> to some. <laughs> Keeping a hostile power out of the Baltic, be it the Catholic League and the Holy Roman Empire, Peter the Great's Russia, or France under Napoleon, became an important British national interest. This involves seeing off hostile coalitions, such as the leagues of armed neutrality, which were principally Balkan leagues with Russia, intended to break Britain's maritime dominance, or Napoleon's continental system, designed to exclude Britain from the mainland European economy. That may also sound familiar. <laughs> we'll pass over that. During the 19th and 20th century, the British continued to shape the Baltic. Most of the time, they tried to keep the Russians, Tsarist or Soviet, hemmed in. Um, and when the Crimean War broke out, the Royal Navy attacked Russian forts or Finland. And in fact, there's a whole combination room uh, in uh, Cambridge College, Gondolin Keys, some of you will know it, uh, which is panelled with timber from a British ship which served there. And there's actually a picture of it in one of the brochures uh, on your seats. After the Russian Revolution, British forces were sent to support the new anti-Bolshevik states, which emerged from the wreckage. In the first half of the 20th century, the British also sought to keep Imperial Germany and the Third Reich boxed into the Baltic. So the Baltic, it was a critical strategic space. In the course of these operations, Britain became a leading guarantor of the Baltic states. Estonian independence after 1918 was very much assisted by the shelter of Royal Navy guns. Of course, you know this, but I'm just <laughs> reminding you of it. Uh, General Johann Leidoner, uh, Commander-in-Chief of the Estonian Armed Forces, at the time stated that he was, and I quote, sure that without the arrival of the British fleet in Tallinn in December 1918, the fate of our country and our people would have been very different, end of quotation. And British support is still uh, positively remembered uh, in Estonia. And to a lesser extent, uh, similar things happened in Latvia, maybe even uh, uh, in Lithuania. At least Britain was an important part of the peace settlement that produced those states. But Britain's relationship with the Baltic also had its problematic, even traumatic moments. During the Napoleonic Wars, Britain attacked Denmark twice, both times with dubious legality and to devastating effect. In 1801, the Royal Navy destroyed most of the Danish fleet to prevent it from falling into French hands. Six years later, the British rammed the point home by attacking Copenhagen itself. They caused extensive damage to the city and considerable civil civilian loss of life, as well as dragging off uh, and destroying or destroying most of the fleet. So actually the relegation of Denmark from being a second class power to being a fourth class power was actually uh, a product of British policy. The word to Copenhagen entered the English language 100 years or so later when the first sea lord, Jackie Fisher, suggested a similar preemptive attack on the Kaiser's fleet. Later, during the Second World War, the Royal Air Force wrecked two of the most beautiful German cities in the Baltic, Lübeck and Rostock. So I mention this simply in the spirit of noting that the relationship has its positive sides, but also its, its problematic and, and traumatic aspects. Of course, there were limits to British power. When London was outraged by the partition of Poland in 1772, satirists asked whether the navy would sail up the Vistula from Danzig, modern-day Gdansk, to Warsaw in order to bring uh, Russia, Prussia, and Austria to heel. Bismarck called, Bismarck, uh, called Britain's bluff in 1864 when Palmerston threatened to intervene to support Denmark over Schleswig-Holstein. If the then small British army landed in Germany, Bismarck quipped, he would have it arrested. And having acted as midwife to the Baltic States in 1918 to 1921, the Royal Navy was unable to prevent the Soviet Union, and perhaps unwilling, to prevent the Soviet Union from annexing them in 1940 and again in 1944. So British power is substantial, but uh, it is not obviously omnipotent. Britain remained engaged in the Baltic after the Second World War, and as part of the NATO alliance, was responsible for the defense of the German coastline there. And the objective, of course, again, was to contain the Soviet Union. Now, in the early 1970s, the relationship gained a new dimension when the United Kingdom joined the European Economic Community 
1973. Economic relations between Denmark and Britain at that time were so close that the Danes had little choice but to join on the same day. But a psychological element was in play too, because British involvement in the EEC provide a, provided in the, in the eyes of the Danes a quality guarantee for what some, some otherwise regarded as a club of domineering Germans and shifty Latins. Um, now, over the 40 years or so of Britain's membership, her relationship with the Baltic developed along diverging axes. On the one hand, as the states of the region integrated with the rest of Europe, the proportion of their trade with Britain declined. So Britain was, in many cases, the primary trade partner, say, in the interwar period, um, and then uh, very often also after 1945. It is no accident that the country with the highest level of bilateral trade with the UK today is Norway, which remained outside the EU. On the other hand, the political, geopolitical, and demographic connection grew. Britain was strongly committed to steady enlargement of the European Union, to include the Baltic countries, um, of course, German Democratic Republic with German unification uh, in 1990, Finland and Sweden in 1995, Poland and the Baltic states in 2004. And these countries tended to cleave to the United Kingdom in major EU debates on economic policy, state subsidies, and issues such as data protection, human rights, and criminal justice. London built on these preferences to try to hedge against Franco-German dominance of the bloc. This was the background to the coalition government's Northern Future Initiative in 2011. Prime Minister David Cameron's relations with the Swedish Premier, uh, Friedrich Reinfeldt, were particularly close. Some elements of the Scandinavian press, in fact, regarded this relationship with suspicion as a possible attempt to subvert the unity of the European Union. So everything is always complicated. Others were sympathetic. The British, as one Foreign Office diplomat told me, uh, were considered natural partners. Moreover, immigration from the region, especially of Poles, Latvians, Lithuanians, and Estonians, has been significant since 1945, when many refugees came to work in Britain from those countries as displaced people from the British uh, zone of occupied Germany, for example, in the Bolt, Signet, and Westward Ho schemes. And one of those refugees, in fact, uh, in 1947, was Charles Clark's late mother-in-law, who had fled Estonia in September 1944 in front of the advancing Russians. After their accession to the EU in 2004, the number of immigrants from these countries grew substantially uh, and was unfortunately also uh, the subject of controversy. And with that, we come uh, to Crimea and Brexit, which mixed the cards in all of these issues. But you will be relieved to hear that I'm not going to address those issues and will yield the floor uh, to Ross Allen uh, to talk about the current, <laughs> the current relationship and then, of course, to Carol Perrime, who will talk about the impact of the Russian threat. Um, but I hope I will have persuaded you uh, a little bit or reminded you, I'm sure in many instances, of uh, the richness of the history that connects us with the Baltic Sea region, and in many cases with Estonia in particular, um, uh, its complexity, uh, and also uh, simply the length of time of that connection, which waxed and waned, uh, but I think uh, we, we agree in the Baltic Geopolitics Program uh, is very important, and we are pursuing as a research project, not least through our Baltic uh, research fellow, uh, Dr. Donatus uh, Kupchunas, who's working on uh, the Vilnius issue immediately after the First World War, where British diplomacy is pretty uh, critical, and hopefully you have a chance to talk to him afterwards. But I think I've uh, said enough uh, at this point. Thank you uh, for listening to me. Um, and I look forward to hearing what Ross Allen has to say. Um, thank you so much. I believe in rugby, that is what is known as a hospital pass, yeah, yeah, yeah. where you throw somebody the ball as they're about to get tackled. Um, may I start by thanking uh, Taya and the Foresight Centre for hosting us today. Thank you so much. Uh, and also uh, a word of thanks and praise uh, for the uh, Baltic Studies programme at the uh, Cambridge Geopolitics Centre. It's a, a fantastic programme. 
Uh, I remember coming to visit you in Cambridge ahead of coming out on my posting here um, and also coming to your recent seminar in Cambridge which I thought was absolutely fantastic. So I would encourage, uh, as, as Charles said, those of you who are interested to sort of look for opportunities to get involved and, and support and so on. Um, so for a brief word of introduction, uh, my name is Ross Allen. I've been uh, British Ambassador to Estonia since June last year, so coming up for one year. Um, if anyone in my family complains that it's cold, I will use your words about this being the Mediterranean of the North. <laughs> <laughs> That's already meant. So when, when you look outside, it looks sunny. So it's, it's deceptive. Um, but also there, there were some fantastic um, phrases and words that you used in your remarks, Brendan, that I wanted to pick up. So I was particularly struck by the fact that you started by saying that the current strength of the relationship between the UK and the Baltic states is not anomalous. Um, and that's, I think that's really important. Um, when I was at the seminar that you hosted in Cambridge recently, there was a moment where one of the speakers flashed up um, a, a, a telegram that was sent back by the first British ambassador to the newly re-independent Estonia. Uh, and he said, well, I can't quote him, but he said, uh, I've arrived, uh, it's a bit chaotic, it's a bit of a mess. Frankly, I'm not sure that any of these countries are actually going to be that important to us in the future. Um, because I think they'll carry on largely trading with Russia, um, and it might be a bit of a backwater, but you know, let's see what happens. Uh, and I think he was wrong. <laughs> um, but the, re the reason we know what he said is that all these papers get released um, after a certain period of time and they become sort of public knowledge, so I'm not spilling any secrets here. Um, but I think he was completely wrong, and I will uh, come on to sort of why and, and uh, why that's been the case. Um, I should first of all say as well that I am, my remarks will be quite Estonia-focused for obvious reasons. Uh, so I've obviously um, spent most of my time uh, here in Estonia working on the UK-Estonia relationship. But where I'm able to, I will touch a little bit particularly on uh, Latvia and Lithuania um, as much as I can. And I think actually having been here almost a year is a good time to sort of do, uh, take part in an event like this, just thinking about the overall sort of state of the relationship. Um, we have uh, David, another former ambassador in this region in the room, but I think and one of the ambassador's jobs, in a way, is to sort of look after the overall health of the relationship uh, between your country and the country you're posted to. And then more important than the sort of health of the bilateral relationship is then turning that healthy relationship into something productive, uh, particularly for your country, um, but obviously ideally for both countries and delivering things that, you know, that, are, that are beneficial for both countries. So a good relationship between the two countries is not uh, an end in itself. And uh, David Liddington will probably remember refusing to do meetings with other, minister, other foreign ministers if all that the Foreign Office could say was, oh, it'll be good for the overall relationship. It'll, you know, it'll, it'll keep them happy. He, he would probably have said, fine, but what are we actually going to get out of this meeting? So that's part of my job here is to make sure that the relationship between the UK and Estonia is good, but also make sure it delivers. Um, I think we're doing that, but I'll explain why. Um, unsurprisingly, I'm going to focus initially, first of all, on the sort of defence and security side of the relationship, because I think that's um, sort of fundamental. And I really think it couldn't be closer. I'm not sure how you could improve on the relationship we have at the moment between the UK and Estonia. So uh, we currently have uh, in Tapa, in sort of a uh, little bit east of here, um, around 1,800 British troops. Uh, we, we, we doubled the size of the British presence here. Um, following uh, Russia's invasion of more of Ukraine. Um, and alongside that we have, we have French and German troops as well, which is fantastic. But the British troops make up the bulk of the uh, NATO enhanced forward presence. And as we look ahead to the uh, Madrid summit for NATO in June, uh, we'll be looking at a sort of longer term posture here uh, and how we uh, you know, strengthen our presence here, not, not just in terms of sort of raw numbers, but more in terms of capabilities um, and our, our, our ministers in the UK and Estonian ministers too have talked about moving from deterrence to defence. There's a very strong view shared, I think, that what we don't want in the future is for uh, Russia to in, invade Estonia or one of the other Baltics or any NATO country, um, wreak the kind of damage that it has in Ukraine here, and then at some point NATO forces come in and help restore the country, but in the meantime, uh, you know, Tallinn or Tartu or other cities look like, you know, some of the cities sadly look, at, look, look like in Ukraine at the moment. What we need is a, is a presence here which is enough to not just deter Russia but also fight off uh, a potential Russian attack. Um, if, we, if we talk about the uh, response to Russia's invasion of more of Ukraine, um, it was very vivid for me because it was obviously Estonian Independence Day. Um, like many other ambassadors, I was up by uh, Tall Herman where the flag flies. 
uh, at dawn for the sort of uh, Independence Day ceremonies. And like all the other diplomats and ministers and defence personnel, we're all basically checking our phones all morning, trying to figure out what was going on as we moved from flag raising to wreath laying to a military parade and so on. There was a, a very, very unusual atmosphere that day. Um, one of the, I think, privileges of being an ambassador is that you don't just go and protest when there's a, you know, there was a huge protest here in uh, Babadus Savalyak, but you don't just go and protest. Like when, after the protest, went over to the foreign ministry to talk to senior officials there, you know, what are we going to do together? And the res uh, in the response to what Russia's done, I think you've seen lots of UK-Estonian coordination. I think we were on, on very much the same page about the threat that Russia posed, even, even ahead of the, uh, uh, what Russia did on the 24th of February. We had shared lots of intelligence um, in the run-up to that with lots of NATO partners, but including with, with the Estonian government. So that meant that they had a good idea of what was coming, uh, as did we. Um, and that's a two-way relationship. We really benefit from our intelligence relationship with Estonia and vice versa. Uh, and since then, in terms of our response, I think you'd have to, any sort of independent observer would say that along with the US and Poland, I think the U UK and Estonia have really led the way in terms of um, sanctions, isolating Russia internationally, providing military aid, providing humanitarian support and so on. And uh, particularly, I have to keep reminding people in the UK that the Estonian population is a 50th of that of the UK. And then, so then when you look at what Estonia has done, whether it's in terms of military support or particularly taking in the number of refugees that you have here and, and welcoming them, giving them jobs, including at Tartu University, so thank you. Um, everything that's been done here in Estonia is absolutely incredible, uh, particularly when you, you, know, you think about the size of the country and the population. Um, another example of the closeness of the relationship is uh, in, in the same sort of field as a uh, thing called Diana. Uh, which is the defence, uh, in Rob, my defence national will help me if I get this wrong, the Defence Innovation Accelerator for the North Atlantic. So it's NATO's uh, sort of tech innovation hub. Uh, and the UK and Estonia have jointly won uh, the process to host uh, the headquarters for that. And that's a, a sign that the UK and Estonia are both playing a leading role within NATO. Uh, and, we, and we want to collaborate and cooperate. And, sort of, and, and technology in particular is an area where we're interested in doing more uh, with Estonia. I did promise I'd cover the other Baltics as well. We've also sent smaller um, military forces, both to Latvia and Lithuania. Uh, we've helped in Lithuania to do with the migrant crisis, where uh, Belarus has been you know, deliberately sort of pushing uh, migrants uh, across the border. We've helped similarly in Latvia. Um, there's a much uh, beefed up uh, British presence in Poland too. And even the presence in Estonia uh, is, is a contribution to wider Baltic security. So my colleagues, our, our British ambassadors in Riga and Vilnius, say that what, what the UK is doing for Estonia is a massive plus from their point of view as well. And their governments say, you know, we're, we're really pleased with what the UK is doing in Estonia. We want you to do more, of course. Uh, and as I said, we're considering what more we can do. But that contributes to wider Baltic security as well. Um, I, I, must, I can't only talk about defence and security, though. I think that's cheating, because that's sort of focusing on the area where the relationship is obviously very, very strong. Uh, there's obviously the, the other side of the relationship, what we in, in the Foreign Office talk about sort of prosperity. Uh, that's thing. I'm, I'm not going to duck the question of Brexit. I'm sure uh, if I had been uh, here a few years ago in a, in a sort of pre-Brexit era, it would have been a very different relationship. We would have had a closer partnership in areas other than defence and security. Um, I see my job as ensuring that we have as close a possible relationship and even from outside the EU, uh, with Estonia, and I know my colleagues feel the same way in the other EU member states. Um, we need to have as close a relationship as possible as we can, despite the fact that we've left uh, the EU. And I get a very strong uh, impression, and I'm told this by Estonian politicians and leaders, um, Estonia wants exactly the same thing too. There's, there's no sort of sour grapes or keeping us at arm's length. There's still a huge appetite here for doing lots with the UK. Um, one of the things we're working on at the moment, which is a big priority for me, is negotiating a tech partnership between the UK and Estonia. Again, coming back to Estonia's uh, strengths in that area. Uh, we also have our um, Education Select Committee coming out, as mentioned this to Taya earlier, coming out in October, um, looking at post-16 education here. And there's so much that I think in the UK we can learn from Estonia in terms of um, how you uh, achieve such fantastic results with your education system. I know you've got your own ideas to how to make it even better but please give us a chance to catch up a bit first, if you can. Um, there's, there's other areas as well. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to go into them in great depth. One, one area is climate change as well. We'd like to work together there. 
Um, it was a privilege recently to take a big group of Estonians from sort of government, industry, um, trade bodies and so on over to the UK, registered to Scotland, we're up in Aberdeen, um, looking at how the UK is trying to transition from fossil fuels uh, into renewables. And uh, actually this is where the, the climate agenda and, and the uh, security agenda sort of come together. And I think now in Estonia, even people who maybe didn't necessarily buy the environmental argument for doing more in renewables, certainly get the idea that we uh, all need to move away from dependency on Russian oil, uh, Russian gas and so on. And we're looking to do even more uh, sort of support Estonia as Estonia looks to go in that sort of same transition. So I, I know to an extent I would say this because, because of my role, but I genuinely think on the defence and security side in particular, the relationship is as close as it's ever been, and I think we'll, we'll only get closer. I think that there's lots of speculation about uh, Sweden and Finland joining NATO. I think if particularly, well, hopefully they'll both join. I think if Finland join in particular, that's sort of game-changing for Estonian security, and I think means we can do even more sort of uh, collectively, and I think that will offer some, some further opportunities, which we might talk, talk about in the future. So I'm going to wrap things up there. Um, if there's a Q&A later, I'm happy to take questions. But thank you. I feel uh, honoured to be on a panel with such distinguished uh, fellow panellists. Um, thank you very much. Our third panellist is Carol Perimai, who's uh, appeared at two other of our Baltic Geopolitical Programme events, one online panel uh, and one uh, in, at the symposium in Cambridge, to which others have referred. He's from Tartu University, has a very distinguished uh, academic history. And we're asking you, Carol, to do the rather difficult thing of thinking, well, given what is happening at the moment with Russia, how, how should we respond? What should we do about this? And you're speaking on behalf of yourself. It's not an official statement, but I hope it will be food for thought in this difficult time. So, Carol, thank you very much for coming. Do you want to talk here or do you want to talk at the moment? I hope it's fine if I talk from here. So yeah, I didn't prepare a, a, a structured uh, presentation, so I was thinking that uh, I would perhaps just throw out some ideas for, for discuss, discussion later. Uh, I was supposed to speak about uh, responding to the current uh, Russian threat, but it's certainly a very broad topic, but um, First, maybe starting from my own position as, a, as an historian and, and working actually daily on history and current affairs, then perhaps uh, one thing to think about would be that uh, it's, it's not only that history helps us to, to make foresights and, and do uh, some prognosis for the future, uh, which is certainly true. And, and, and the far back you can go, actually, in history, uh, the better. So uh, contemporary history is, 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 is sometimes not enough, you know. And Brenda showed that very well, going back to, the, to a thousand years. And, and, and it's, it's really important to understand, for example, Britain's role in, in, the, in the Baltic region. And I, I was wondering, uh, how much of that stuff, this uh, uh, hemp, for example, uh, came from Estonia or Livonia. So that's, that would be interesting to know. And, and maybe you, you can add something to that. So historians, or also not historians, but also uh, people who make those foresights uh, have to know pretty much of history. Uh, as to Russia, for example, it's really helpful to, to know uh, uh, the last couple of uh, hundred years. 400 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I knows that uh, really well. Uh, 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 personally, I've been reading uh, a lot about Hitler these days. Actually, started just uh, incident, coincident, uh, incidentally before the war, and then uh, discovered that it's, it's really relevant. So actually, to understand uh, Putin now, I, I recommend reading uh, about Hitler. Uh, 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 for example, this uh, issue that, why now? Why, why do that now? Uh, it's it's uh, really possible that there are similarities with uh, Hitler's uh, uh, 
having no time, you know, the health issue, for example, that he has to do it now because uh, Hitler, Hitler was a person who was very worried about his health, thinking that he, would, he might die uh, very soon. So he was in a hurry. So these these things uh, things help, and, and sometimes it it, it um, explains why why many experts uh, get it wrong uh, because uh, they don't have that uh, background in history. I, I'm not saying that I, I was uh, right in February. Actually, a week before I started, I thought that uh, Putin wouldn't be so stupid to try that. Uh, and our, many of our military experts also were saying that you know, there were not enough troops to, to do that large-scale invasion. But nevertheless, Putin did it. And uh, of course, it's, it's nothing. If you think about it now, then uh, it happens uh, a lot, uh, very often. Hitler invaded uh, uh, Russia, uh, uh, but at, this, at the time, all, all experts got it wrong, not only German experts. They, they thought Russia would have maximum six weeks. Uh, so now people thought that Ukraine will have like, uh, three days. And, and that's nothing, it's not surprising that uh, experts get things uh, wrong. In the First World War, people thought that the war would be over by the end of 1914. And Britain went to war in 39 without uh, knowing how to win the war. No, that's went to war. So that's the other possibility that leaders uh, make a decision without uh, expert knowledge, let's say. Uh, but uh, historians uh, do their trade uh, by thinking about the future uh, on the basis of their uh, foresight about, uh, about the future. So most of the, the history uh, that we have now, the history books, uh, are written uh, on the basis of, of some kind of a foresight. And it was a Trinity uh, fellow, Edward, Edward Carr, who said that uh, historians uh, are not based in the present, writing about history, but rather in the future. And he, his own career was a very good example of that, because he thought the Soviet Union would be the future of mankind, and he wrote about uh, Stalin's uh, industrial, industrialization as the new uh, model for the future, uh, which also meant that his whole career uh, was uh, sent to the dust, uh, dustbin after the Soviet Union collapsed. And now we, what we're seeing is that a lot of the history that has been written is also uh, coming irrelevant because the future, thinking about the future was wrong. People got it wrong. Uh, one of the examples is, for example, uh, one of the examples is the uh, history writing about NATO enlargement. A lot of it uh, has been based on uh, the idea that. Uh, Russia can be brought into the Western world, or at least engaged uh, with, or, or the partnership can be built with Russia. And so the NATO, NATO enlargement was a mistake and, and needlessly uh, uh, provoked Russia. Uh, of course, no, uh, like these historians, uh, they have a problem, but uh, most of them would, would not say that they were wrong, actually, because people would uh, just uh, find, uh, find another uh, explanation for that. But uh, yeah, that's a problem, because uh, a lot of people are uh, uh, very uh, dogmatic, let's say, uh, um, even if they get it wrong then they, they will always find an uh, explanation. For example, uh, all the people who read Putin uh, wrong, uh, like uh, John Mersheimer, uh, 
uh, he, he played with, with, with uh, our, our Estonian uh, uh, scholar Ray Müllerson. Uh, they would be able to say that, you know, uh, uh, Putin made a mistake. Or, or uh, uh, um, he got it wrong. But on the whole, they would uh, continue um, uh, saying that uh, Russia was uh, provoked. Russia had uh, little alternative uh, than to uh, try to do something about uh, the uh, threat of the, from the West, or let's say, uh, West overreaching uh, itself. Uh, so, um, and I'm talking about uh, this realist uh, understanding of uh, international relations. I think uh, um, it's, it's a, um, a very bad uh, way to analyze the situation. really interesting and important questions okay. into the framework, so don't feel the need to stop right mm. now. What, what we're going to do when you've finished is ask for general debate, so you could come back to future discussion. Yeah. Uh, as, uh, historian, historians now, uh, now, many of them uh, think, are thinking, what, uh, what, what's uh, uh, trying to make sense of what's going on? The questions are uh, the question is, uh, uh, is this an end of an era? And, and if it is, then uh, which era? Is it the end of the post-Cold War period uh, or, or, or something else? And I think this is uh, 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 quite a fruitful uh, uh, line of thought. If you had uh, a new course at the University of Helsinki, Exactly on that uh, topic uh, this spring, uh, and, and uh, there's a, there are a lot of very very interesting uh, questions of so what's what's going on, what's what's ending, and, and um, is it, uh, for example, end of uh, uh, appeasement? Uh, and I would say that. Uh, it, it, it's not end of appeasement uh, if, if we define appeasement historically, uh, practiced by Britain in the, in the 1930s, uh, then Britain was a, a power that uh, could not back its, its global interests uh, militarily anymore, so it, it had to pick and peace some some of the rival countries, while uh, uh, actually standing uh, or, or uh, preparing to fight the other more, more dangerous rivals. So this was a policy of necessity uh, and, and a strategy uh, in order to uh, prevent war and, and, and save some of the British interests, global interests. And it would be unfair to say that today, we, this, uh, in, since the 90s, we were appeasing Russia 
it was something else. Uh, and it, it, uh, it was uh, building bridges to Russia, having partnership with Russia, and also uh, uh, this was taking sides, and, and uh, uh, it, it came, for example, at the cost of, of Ukraine. And we think of the 1994 Budapest uh, Agreement, it was hailed as a great success at the time. Uh, Ukraine uh, was got rid of, of nuclear weapons uh, against uh, almost nothing, no, no security guarantees. And uh, at the time, actually, if uh, John Mersheimer uh, got something right, it was actually his uh, criticism of that decision to deprive Ukraine of uh, nuclear weapons. And uh, our president, John Mary, actually, uh, was quite concerned about that. So that's one of the things that, uh, and, and it's, it's now been written about how Ukraine was actually mistreated in, in the 90s and, and, and until today. Uh, uh, and then, of course, all this uh, the question about uh, the Russian expertise who, who got Russia wrong and who got uh, right. So there was always a competition uh, between this Russian expertise and the bots and Eastern, Eastern Europeans were always told that you, are, you, you get it uh, wrong. Uh, uh, the Germans told us you get it ro uh, wrong, they would call uh, all the others. Tarja Halloran said that uh, the Estonians are hysterical and have a post Soviet uh, trauma. And uh, recently, the German president, uh, Frank Walter Steinmeier, acknowledged that you know, we should, we should have listen to East East Europeans. But it's not enough, I think. It's, it's not enough. Uh, they have to apologize. Definitely. They have to apologize because we have uh, uh, been put through that for several decades. This uh, talk that we get Russia right, we are hysterical, we, have, we are the post-communist people, we are not post-communist, we are something else, we are post-transition, we are post-Cold War, but we are not post-communist. And it's a question, it's a question of if we have, have ever been post-communist. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And, and it, it's a logic question if Eastern Europe is actually post-communist or post-transition countries. Um, so this is about, uh, and this is also, of course about the Ostpolitik. It's, it's, is it the end of Ostpolitik? And I think it's, it's the end of Ostpolitik, not the end of appeasement. And it, it will change our, many of our, our assumptions about foreign policy, I think, because Ostpolitik was uh, considered for decades as a, as a really successful uh, model to deal with dictatorships. And it was successful, but what, now we have to ask, was it successful because what was done uh, by Willy Brandt uh, before him, the, the goal, or was it because something else, uh, because, for example, the corporate pain or, or some other reason? It's not, not sure that Ostpolitik actually uh, brought along that change in the, in the 1980s, of, although it certainly play the role. So these are my ideas. Thanks. Carol, thank you very much for that. Uh, wow, I think we'd have to say. In fact, we had, as you talk about us politic, we had an event last week, an online event in our centre, uh, dealing with the situation in Germany, where we said, what is happening to Ostsee politik? What should yeah. that be? And that's the thing. So, firstly, thanks to all three of our speakers for a tremendous set of contributions and extremely stimulating. As I said, we're now going to ask your comments and thoughts, and 
Christina Tennyson will respond to them. Christina, why don't you come and sit, sit, sit here? So when you've made your comments, Christina will give her conclusions and thoughts on what we've been said. So, any comments, questions on what's been said? James, you can, sorry, both of you, I think. Yeah, I'll just provide the mic for the answer to it. Today or yesterday in Spiegel was an, an article about one Moscow ties and he really is looking to shed a light on, on the 90s course policies towards those three old states and it was actual denial, full denial. Not the entirely executed in the way like it was I'll say, imagined by the very top of Chancellery, but still it was very much a denial of, of, of uh, and, and trade off on, on, on expense of, of, of bolts. Uh, to be frank and straight, not polite. And therefore, uh, and we, uh, we had our own experience with that, including me, myself, being in those days dealing with the Germans about some issues related to the security and so on. So basically, I can tell you that it was a, uh, a thing we have felt, and why I'm now commenting uh, is the thing we have felt throughout our history, at least the modern one that we have certain doubts about being a, an object of trade-off between great powers of Russia and Germany. And everybody else who is standing on the way of it is welcomed, most welcome, and actually loved. Uh, among them Brits because of their own causes, but it was done. So basically, we, are, we, we have this problem, mental problem here indeed, but different kind of, not that we've been suspected of, but actually something else. And uh, we've seen it. We've seen it several times. And we've lived it through. And this knowledge, it's not just knowledge of academic or theoretical level. It's a practical one. The majority of the generations who lived through the later period of the Soviet time, at least, starting from the Second World War, they are still alive and they are still remembering. And therefore many things are clear, like crystal clear things for us, but very difficult and misty things to grasp by others. And therefore the, the job you are trying here, which is historical retrospective based, but still it, it, it is, by my mind, should provide at least some glimpse of this logic behind of psyche of, of local Baltic uh, nations taking into account their historical uh, background and experience. Thank you very much, James. I think actually somewhat related. Um, you probably have heard of the Bulgarian mystic, Baba Venga. Yeah, <laughs> splendidly medieval, blind, and reciting Nostradamus-style uh, predictions. And I'm sure you've heard of the prediction of the Lord of Peace who will lead Eastern Europe to domination. Yes, the Lord of Peace, of course, is Vladimir, but it is not Putin, and the country is not Russia. It is, of course, Zelensky and Ukraine. And I use that because there is this idea of agency, which I think is the point that you're making, that Ukraine is furious with the fact that Russia denies it agency, and so is Estonia, and so are all of the countries of Central and Eastern Europe. And this is the point, that we are being denied agency. Now, the point is, if it is the wrong Vladimir, we've got the agency back, haven't we? Comments, please. Thank you. We'll keep on going around. David. Uh, thank you, everybody, for a very really fascinating discussion. Um, a, a, a question of ignorance, really, but Estonia and other countries in the Baltics have been very clear about what they think we should have taken as approach to this generation of Russian leaders, mm -hmm. and we haven't always listened. What is your advice to dealing with the next generation of Russian youth? Thanks. David, also. I'd like to follow up what David, David Ken said, because if you look through the list of universities that are partners in the Baltic programme in the leaflet, there is one country 
with a history of involvement on the Baltic and the Baltic coast, where we don't have a university, and that is Russia. And I'd be fascinated to hear from our Estonian friends, you know, how, particularly in the light of what has happened this year, we should be going about this. Do we simply say, forget it, you know, that Russia is interested in doing things to the Baltic, not seeing itself as part of a Baltic conversation, or is there merit in trying to have some people-to-people -people contacts, particularly with a younger, educated generation of Russians, and how do, do we go about handling the reality that Russia is there in the Baltic, um, or, or do we simply say that's off the agenda for as far ahead as we can predict? Just to add to what David said, you know, what's our end game here in uh, having in mind all this uh, Russia-Ukrainian war? as far as Ukraine is concerned, but it's also more importantly for us as far as the Baltic states are concerned. Is it the new Iron Curtain running around eastern border of Estonia and probably somewhere inside Ukraine? Or is it some sort of modus vivendi with Russia because every war ends in peace? And even though we're fighting just a proxy war here, but still it's, it's a war for us as well. And every war has warriors. So what our war aims in medium to long term? Thank you. We've certainly gone into big questions today. Is there any, any others anybody would like to raise for I'll ask the panel to respond quickly, but okay, let me just go. I'll go to you, Carol, first and then Brendan then uh, uh, there's an extra mic on the table. Okay. okay. Uh, can I give Christina the, the question about cooperating with Russian uh, universities to you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think the phrase is lucky you. <laughs> uh, because uh, Delta University has, has, has debated that, uh, and, and other universities, and maybe you know more about that. And, and the agency is, is a really uh, important uh, question, and, and that uh, relates also to the notion of proxy war, because it, it kind of denies agency. Uh, and, and that's exactly what uh, realists uh, say, that, uh, and, and they actually reproduce uh, Russian propaganda, that it's a proxy war, it's Russia, uh, United States, uh, US war or NATO war against uh, Russia, whereas actually it's, it's Ukraine is, is fighting its independence war, or other, other ways you, you call it, uh, and we are helping Ukraine. And, and uh, it's about Ukrainian self-determination, and, and that's how the Western world is uh, uh, functions. Actually, that's uh, how NATO and the European Union uh, functions, and uh, it um, it's unique. Uh, these are unique uh, alliances in the sense that they actually uh, give more uh, voice and power to small nations than they would deserve uh, by their uh, size. It's probably historically unique, uh, as far as I know. Uh, and it has been one of the surpri surprises of this uh, crisis that uh, uh, how uh, well uh, positioned, how, how much the West has uh, been listening to us in the Baltic, for example. Our Prime Minister, in particular, has been uh, very uh, influential in, in both of those uh, alliances. Thank you. I'm going to take Brendan and then Ross, but then I'm going to come to you, Christina. And I thought you could come at the end with everything yeah. Manchesterian, but I think it'd be better <laughs> if you came in uh, right through the whole process and then come at the end. Brendan. Uh, th thank you very much. Really interesting questions. I, I won't comment on all of them. Um, just a word on Germany, which is a country um, I know quite well and have studied. Um, but I want to begin with, uh, by saying that I understand the predicament historically that this region has experienced of being caught between Germany and Russia um, and also being the victim, uh, on the one hand, of being ploughed over uh, by conflict between the two, but also been the victim of, of trade-offs, which is what was mentioned. 
Um, and I'd like to give you, as a comparison, my own country is Ireland. Um, and we suffer quite a bit from a sense of being victimised. Um, one of my colleagues, Liam Kennedy, coined the term mope, the most oppressed people ever. <laughs> but I often say to my Irish fellow countrymen, I said, we are located between the United Kingdom and the United States. And we no doubt we have our complaints. But that is grade A, in geopolitical terms and historical terms, that is absolutely grade A property. <laughs> If you want to buy, you know, at the beginning of the 20th century, you will buy somewhere around there. Um, imagine if you're located between Germany and Russia, which of course was Poland's fate, but also your fate. So I don't need to elaborate on that. But let me just uh, conclude with, with some remarks on Germany, which has been heavily criticised, and rightly so, here. And I've joined in that criticism and made the criticism also for the last 10 years. But I think what we've seen is that the, the problem with Germany is that it wields power, but it wields for this particular contest the wrong sort of power. The kind of power which, A, can be turned against it, as we've seen on the energy issue, but also insofar as it doesn't boomerang, it does not have deterrent power, or at least not sufficient deterrent power. Um, you know, geoeconomic power is not the same as geopolitical power. And that historically has been the case, and that is currently the case. And I suspect that what we're seeing now in Europe in general is a little bit of a, a recalibration of what we sense are the, the, the loci of power. I think people had a view that Germany was an actor in certain, of certain dimensions, which are now, it's not just a question of German intentions, it's actually a question of German capacity. Um, the Germans actually are not capable at the moment. I mean, they could do better, but even if they tried to do more, they don't, simply don't have the military means and they don't have the uh, strategic culture to, at the moment to do what needs to be done. So I want to round that off with a question which we might come back to when we uh, go back to the audience or perhaps the panellists might come back to this. But it's a question I always ask um, interlocutors in Eastern Europe and in the Baltic Sea region, which is this, is that if you're in difficulty, we all know the first number you call is Washington. But what if Washington were uh, not answering. Which number would you call next? And would that no? Sorry, London. Sir, I, thank you. That is the <laughs> that is the answer. How, I how, much, how much should you pay? Me? <laughs> <laughs> that is what I, I, I think was, is the right answer. I think that answer for many people would have been different five years ago. They would probably have. I've quite often heard Berlin when I ask this question. Uh, when I said no, actually, you should ring London. Um, so I'll leave it there. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. I think you spoke um, excellently there in terms of questions around Germany. So thank, thank you for that explanation. There was a question around war aims. Uh, I think our, our foreign secretary gave a very good speech uh, a couple of nights ago at the Mansion House in London, and she said very clearly, uh, Russia out of all of Ukraine. And I think that is that is a statement of British policy currently. Uh, the, the permanent secretary of the defence ministry here said, it's great to hear that that's been Estonia's view since sort of day two or three of the conflict, but that's fine that we're, you know, we're on the same page. I think it, I've been asked the question in interviews about when would we ever consider taking the sanctions away? And so I would add to that, I would say rush out of all of Ukraine and the rest of its neighbours and paying reparations to restore Ukraine to, to what it was. And, and giving up people for whom there's a credible case uh, for a war crimes trial. That would be my starting point, which you may say is unrealistic, in which case the sanctions remain. Um, there was also a question around a sort of, I think, a sort of future successor to Putin. And I know there's discussion at the moment, there's speculation, might he get removed at some point? My view, and I think this is shared by some of the Estonians I talked to, is that even if Putin was removed tomorrow, it would, they would be, the people who removed him would be removing him for making a strategic mistake and screwing up, not for doing something that they could actually fundamentally bad. Uh, so you would probably get somebody equally bad, but who hadn't made that strategic mistake. So that may be because I've been in Estonia too long, that I'm so down on <laughs> the likelihood of there being a positive Russian government that you can engage with. But I personally think it would be generations before there are at least a generation, if not generations, before there is a Russian government that the, the countries like Estonia and the UK would want to sort of do constructive business with. 
I, I, don't, I, I think it was an interesting question, particularly for the historians, whether there was a brief opportunity in the 90s. Uh, but again, going back to the seminar that I was at in Cambridge, was there a brief, if, if Yeltsin had been younger, uh, not drunk as much, uh, if the economic reforms had gone better, was there a brief window when, you know, I think we tried to open up to Russia, but basically it sort of you know, collapsed, there were economic problems, he got removed, we ended up with Putin, but you know, what was there an opportunity then? Uh, I don't know. Um, Last thing, we've, we've criticised Germany quite a bit for different reasons. Um, I think in terms of being honest with you as an audience, I think uh, some of our politicians in the UK in the last few days have also acknowledged that we have made mistakes as well in terms of dealing with Russia. I think we were, it's, it's a strange one, because I think we were always clear about the threat that was posed, and we talked about you know, the Salisbury poisonings and so on, and, we, and we've been on the same page as Estonia. Uh, but I think we've acknowledged that we were much too welcoming to Russian money, uh, in the UK, into London, we, we sort of turned a blind eye to where some of the money had come from. We welcomed all these oligarchs. Um, we've taken a lot of steps now recently uh, to deal with that, but I think you know, most politicians in the UK would acknowledge we left that far too late. Um, I think, there's a, I think we, we can make a case that if they were trying to buy influence, it didn't work. If you look at our current policy towards Russia, has, like, if they were donating money or whatever, or whatever they were trying to do to make us more pro-Russian, that definitely didn't work. Um, but yeah, I think, I think we shouldn't exempt ourselves from sort of you know, blame in, in, in certain respects. I also think now, I think our, um, Estonia has welcomed so many refugees from Ukraine. Uh, we have welcomed some to the UK, but our process has been horribly bureaucratic. And there are Ukrainians who I think should be able to move to the UK who are stuck there because we're not dealing with it in, a, in an administrative way fast enough. And that, that is bad, and we need to get better at that uh, rapidly. Christina, I'm going to come to you now and just ask you that there are some specific points, but I think any general views you have in the round about this conversation, how it could be taken forward, would be very valuable. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. I'll first start then with the point Carl actually pushed me to answer, that is cooperation between Estonian universities and Russian universities. And officially, we cancelled all the cooperation, and we went even so far that during the next academic year, we don't accept any citizens from Russia to start to study, except the ones who have been studying already in EU, which is that we don't continue and we do, don't do any cooperation, and the only kind of grey area is when we cooperate with people who don't represent their universities or any kind of official status, which is Vladimir, Volodya, whoever, just kind of on personal cooperation, but not within any framework. So, and I started to think, what will be after Putin? And my first thought is, there will be next Putin. Hmm. That the Russian systems are built this way, that they kind of produce next Putin. This is my own personal view, and there might be like softer times and hard times, but next round will be there for him. And uh, when you arrive or raise the issue kind of history and you said about are we post the communist countries or not, then I started to think that Estonia and all Baltic countries were always feeling themselves like Western Europe within Soviet time. We are kind of occupied, but we were considered from other kind of part of Soviet Union and also by ourselves like Western Europe. So that's why kind of this notion is uh, very kind of, um, uh, it's very different for us how we see ourselves. And uh, so these were my reactions shortly. But when listening to your interesting talks, I picked up one central point from each of you. And when Brandon uh, were giving so many like fruitful, interesting examples, you basically went back to the Middle Ages. And I once again kind of noticed how rich and complex relationships are. We kind of tend to see the iceberg just on water, but how much is behind that? And you said very clearly and openly that there are both positive sides and negative sides. And I kind of started to think basically everything is changing and you never know when one side is turning, but it's good to know how long it is and how much you have it depending. So thank you once more for giving all these interesting examples. And uh, Alla, Karas Alan, who just discovered that you are living now in Mediterranean. <laughs> 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 if you haven't noticed this before, then uh, I have a light from your speech the point that diplomacy or international relations should deliver. That it's 
nice to have these nice talks and so on, but finally, like you say, if you just talk around, then I don't start this meeting, but I want to see what is the real outcome. And sometimes it's hard actually to get to this point. So what is the delivering? And you also nicely say, it doesn't matter how big or small you are, but you can still learn from each other. Like UK is learning from tech industry and we are learning from you, and so on. Uh, so it's uh, kind of nice to see how, how we should sometimes focus more than what we actually delivering. And I think that this uh, splendid network, I, I already smell it, that this network starts to deliver, <coughs> not, to, not just talking. And uh, thank to Carl, I remember this, uh, this thought, I sometimes try to forget, uh, or kind of tend to forget this, that historians don't deal and talk about past, nor even about present but they tend to talk about future. <laughs> and we should remember that when we're reading, because we kind of try to think, oh, okay, that's past, that's, uh, that's kind of what have been done, but actually it's basically lessons learned and foresight for the future. And thank you that you once more reminded us how, uh, how we in this foresight center, with this, within this network, are actually nicely connecting past, present, and future together. So these were my three points, and thank you for once more putting me to think through this text. And thank you for bringing all these uh, excellent speakers to Estonia. And thank you, Charles, for putting it together and dealing with it so actively throughout the last two years already. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Christina, for that. I should say, when we tried to start this network, um, Tartu University and Christina and their colleague Eric uh, were fantastic in encouraging us to develop this kind of dialogue and I really, really do appreciate it. We did have quite a lot of discussion, uh, David, within the network about whether to invite a Russian member university and one or two suggestions were made. But the view was taken, and remember we were forming this just over a year ago, that with the way in which Russia the Russian state in its various forms relates to Russian universities, it would be very difficult for us to have the kind of, we hoped, um, intellectually freewheeling and uh, uh, conversation if they were present. For example, this conversation today has been pretty wide ranging, some pretty sharp questions have been raised and there would have been a worry if there were Russian universities present, not necessarily about the individuals but about the way that information went through. Now, that is not to argue that we shouldn't try and understand the Russian point of view. We had an in-conversation online, which I had with Dmitry Trainin from the uh, Carnegie Foundation in Moscow. Uh, it was a very open conversation to try and understand how people were thinking in, in Russia. But that was the, the view that we came to in which um, Christina was strongly supportive of it, but it wasn't simply Tatu, it was, it was the universal view that we wouldn't really be able to have the kind of network we wanted if we moved it forward. So, uh, we've really enjoyed this. We're delighted you've come today. Um, I do urge you to engage back with us uh, if you would like to work with us <coughs> anyway. Thank you very much, David. Uh, and to see how we could work together on different things. I want to express thanks to the panel, of course, and for the way you've contributed to this session. I say the way in which you've contributed, because you've all been provocative in the way you've been putting forward things and speaking very directly, which I think is invaluable. I want to thank James for being the entrepreneur, if that's not a word you disrespect, James, uh, who has put this um, together. But I particularly want to thank Taya for you, for the work that you and your colleagues have done in making this event. It's such a beautiful venue, a wonderful room uh, to meet in. Thank you very much indeed oh, for yeah. meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And I, I think you were generous enough to, to say that people would be welcome to stay for a glass of, is it okay, why not? You said beforehand it was only water, but is it okay? <laughs> <laughs> is it okay? No, why? I'd like to say that uh, let's not achieve, uh, achieve excited that uh, yet uh, we later. Yeah. So yeah, you are, uh, everyone is warmly welcome to, to enjoy the snacks and drinks and have a good time and uh, get acquainted uh, to each other.
doesn't know each other yet, perhaps. So, yes, and of course, uh, continuum is very vivid and exciting conversation about what's going to be the next world order. I see that the dust is not settled yet enough to, to see it, but it was very intriguing to hear that probably we are exiting one era, but what era we are exiting and what's, what lays ahead. But, so, as Professor Carlota Perez has said recently about the, the um, uh, green transformation, that it's much easier to see what's wrong with the current system than to realistically uh, imagine uh, the one that could uh, replace it. Yeah, so, so, yeah, I, I believe there's a lot uh, to discuss uh, with the help of some, uh, some drinks and snacks and uh, enjoy yourself and enjoy the evening. Thank you.